Good morning, poultry fans, and welcome to another uh, show. And we've got a very special guest with us this morning as we've got Jeff Maddox from the Fur Trail Company. Jeff is a poultry nutritionist, and Jeff has a real knack for being able to take a complicated subject and simplifying it to where we can all understand it. And probably the best nutritional speaker I have ever heard when it comes to poultry feeds. Jeff, welcome this morning and happy to have you with us. Hey, thanks, Rip. I appreciate the invite and I'm glad to be here. Um, <clears throat> I've been working poultry nutrition now for 26 years. Um, and I am unlike other poultry nutritionists who work for the large integrators. I actually work for the small farmers. So whether it's people with three chickens in their backyard or up to 10 or 15,000 chickens, but they're pretty much raising them outside, open air, moving them around in fields, um, more of a natural way of doing things. Um, mm -hmm. And I do a lot with the organic folks who prefer to you know, keep their birds in an organic fashion. So um, <clears throat> coming at it from that standpoint, you know, we've always, I've always felt that if I overfeed the birds or give them more than what the bare minimum requirements are that I can keep them healthier and they function better and they reproduce better. And they're just all the, all the way around more fun to have. You know, everybody knows that you're, when your birds are healthy, they're a lot of fun. When they're not, you just, you're pulling your hair out, trying to get it's it under pain. control. It's a pain. And <clears throat> so I'd rather pay for it ahead of time and try and keep them as healthy as possible than then try and work from behind, you know, and, and I watch a lot of folks out there and they go to whether it's tractor supply or wherever their garden center, or their farm center is, and they're checking prices, right? They're not checking mm -hmm. the contents of the bag. They're not checking the nutritional levels. They're not looking at the ingredients in there, right? So it, they're looking for $16.95. You know, if they see one for 22 and one for 16, you know which one they're going to buy. Right. Well, <clears throat> eventually that comes around and bites you. So um, it, it, I encourage everybody to read the tags, look at the nutrient levels, you know, understand what you're reading. If you need help with that, reach out to me, you know, take pictures of the tags, email them to me, right? I'll tell you which one is full of garbage and which one is going to be the healthier choice for your chickens. And do this for a lot of folks. Okay. So it, it's not a problem. I'd rather see people have good, healthy chickens. And you know, the worst thing I do is open up Facebook and I go to a couple of different poultry groups and people are talking about this sick chicken and that sick chicken. And you know, uh, it's just no fun at all. You know, it takes the fun out of raising chickens when, you know, when you go out to a, a group of sick birds. But, you know, you asked me to talk about nutrition a little bit, um, you know, going up through the different phases and, and kind of what to look for and, <clears throat> or what I'm, you know, what I'm formulating for, you know, first off, try and avoid byproducts. Okay. You know, uh, byproducts are put in feeds to keep, to make them cheaper, but people don't understand they have no nutritional value. They're not adding anything to that feed for the bird. All they're doing is diluting it down to, to get the price point down. Um, a lot of the folks that I'm working with currently are actually seeing that when they feed a higher nutritional value without byproduct, higher nutritional value feed without byproducts, they're feeding 20 to 25% less per day and getting better results. Okay. So the first number one failure that I see, and this isn't just in the poultry world, it's everywhere, is some people make this assumption that all feeds are created equal. So if it says 16% layer, it's the same as the 16% layer beside it and the one beside that and the one beside that, and they're not. So learning how to read between the lines on the ingredients is really important. <clears throat> uh, look for as many whole grain when I say whole grain, whole grains were used to process the feed, whether you're using a pellet or a mash, look for as many whole grains. Uh, the, when you see the word byproducts, you know, that should be a red flag to you. Um, you know, and that means that they're diluting it down. 
you know, and now over the years working with <clears throat> folks like you, Rip, and other breeders, uh, I've been working with breeders more intently over the last 10 years. Um, breeding birds and show fowl and, you know, the high-end exotic fowls, their nutritional requirements can't be purchased over the counter at a local feed store. It just, nobody's making a feed for a truly good feed for show fowl or breeding fowl. Um, <clears throat> as I've dug into it and I've worked with breeders over the past years, the nutritional values, particularly in the vitamins and the amino acids, need to be t about 20% higher than a regular backyard chicken. Okay, just, you know, the, the basic laying in that somebody's gonna have in their backyard, they're gonna do fine with tractor supply or whoever's you know, 16, 17, 18% layer feed. But it's not gonna put the plumage on and it's not gonna give the, the attributes, you know, those distinct attributes to a breeding type chicken. It's just not, they're not gonna reach their full genetic potential. So when I say that, it's like, <clears throat> if you're picking a chick starter, instead of picking an 18% chick starter, you should be looking for probably a 22 to 24% game bird starter and uh, again, looking at those ingredients that are in there and looking at the levels. For instance, you should be looking for almost a 6,000 vitamin A units, international units of vitamin A per pound of feed. All right, most chick starters out there are only running at 3,000. So it's about half of where it needs to be. Um, the fowl that we're talking about today develop slower than the commercial birds. They're not made to be, <clears throat> you know, finished in eight weeks. They're not, you know, they're just a different breed. Um, their feed intake is actually a lot less than a lot of the commercial or domestic fowl out there. So we have to get more per bite than, you know, for our type of chicken or our type of fowl, we have to get more per bite than what most feeds are offering out there. So pretty much all the way through all, each one of the feeds, we want to run at between five and 6,000 international units of vitamin A. I'd like to have 1,500, actually 2,000 international units of vitamin D. These are things you can look at on the tag. These are required by law to be on a tag. If you see a chicken feed tag that doesn't have these on it, it's not legally labeled and you probably need to keep looking. So if they can't even follow the basic guidelines for labeling requirements, chances are that there's something else missing. Um, vitamin E, it's gonna be really hard to find, but I like to have 50 international units per pound. Um, calcium levels should, you know, for young and developing birds, whether it's starter grower or developer, you want about a 1.25 on your calcium level. So your bottom would be, your minimum would be one, your maximum would be one and a half. Um, phosphorus is a big corner that a lot of feed companies cut because phosphorus is not cheap. And I like to see a phosphorus level running around 0.75 to 0.8. It's gonna give you better bone formation. You know, uh, working with breeders, I hear about crooked keels and I hear about different things like that. And a lot of that's coming to not enough or the wrong kind of minerals being used some of that can be avoided by hitting the right mineral contents uh, you know then you roll into your amino acids some are going to guarantee they have to guarantee methionine and lysine lysine uh, on a on a show or breeder fowl should be at 1.1 and the methionine level should be 0.45 or higher actually i like plant now, they, they're going to give you minimum guarantees, which means that's not their actual amount. They rounded them down to make sure that they hit their requirements. So <clears throat> chances are they're going to be about a half a, not a half a percentage point, but they're going to be about 10% higher than what's actually on the label, just to give them some protection. The state, each state is required to do a feed inspection. So twice a year, they go to a feed manufacturers, feed stores, any places that feeds are being sold, and they'll take samples. <clears throat> Sooner or later, you're gonna see this little white sticker on the side of the bag you bought 
that says sampled by the state of Florida in your case, or whatever state you're in, um, that's going to happen. And, you know, the states have a little bit of a quality control guarantee built in for testing to make sure that things are being done right. And that's, that's a good thing. So starter feed, depending on how it's put together and hitting those amino acids I just talked about, for sure one of 22, 23, 24. Now the variation on that protein that I, is how heavily plumaged is the bird. So if you have more of the exotics with a lot of plumage on them, right? Or you need better feather, look at the methionine level, because that's going to be your key driver for, you know, how that feather turns out. But also total protein is going to make a difference. Now don't go crazy. When I say total protein, that doesn't mean I want you to run out and buy some 28% game bird starter because too much protein is just as bad as not enough. The kidneys of the bird has to process all excess protein through the kidneys. If you continue to burn them up by putting too much, exceeding their protein requirement for an extended period of time, you're actually causing kidney damage in the long term, which is going to shorten the lifespan of the bird. Rip, you look like you have a question. I, no, I, I, just one thing I'd, I'd like to point out here. I've got several friends who raise Phoenix and, and have these ultra long tails on the males. And I can see where this would, information would certainly benefit them because those feathers are in a state of constant growth. They never really mature. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've got some friends and, and they all have four or five foot tails on their males easily. Um, but I, I just, in my own mind, I wonder how much more impressive would those birds look if they were on this kind of a diet, you know, one with really good super, super nutrition, um, just some food for thought. Yeah, it is. And <clears throat> so unfortunately breeders and show, show folks out there, well, again, they can't find that perfect feed. And even if they did, a lot of them would reject it based on price. But those Phoenix, once they get past about 28, 30 weeks of age, most of their body is fairly filled out. Okay, so keeping them on this really high protein level feed is not necessarily the right answer. It's getting the feed with elevated levels of amino acids. So it's developing a feed for the Phoenix and it can be an 18% feed, but I might have my methionine levels at 0.6. Now having extra methionine and extra lysine and extra amino acids doesn't hurt the kidneys. Okay. It, it, at that point, it's not going through the body as a protein and it's easier for the body to utilize as an amino acid. So, and even the large commercial, you know, the Purdue's, the Pilgrim Prides, et cetera, the Tysons of the world, you know, they're reducing protein levels in their chicken feeds and they're putting in amino acids to get the desired results. We just kind of have to catch up to this technology with show birds. Interesting. <clears throat> okay. You know, they're knocking two points off their protein because soybeans cost money. So by manipulating the amino acids more precisely, they're, they're able to achieve the same results and save money in the end. <clears throat> and the same could be said for, you know, breeding and show fowl. You know, if we, if we could find feed manufacturers to work with us, but we're scattered out all over the place. Nobody wants to pay shipping. You know, I, I could go to a feed mill here in Pennsylvania and say, Hey, can you make this show fowl feed for me? Yes, sir. Make it for you. But then till I ship it to Florida and I add four or five dollars a bag for shipping, you know, you get it down there. And, and if I came to you and Rip said, hey, I have the perfect show feed. If you didn't know me from Adam and I said, it's going to cost you thirty two dollars a bag. You're going to be like, what? I can go down the street and buy, you know, twenty dollar feed. Right. I've heard that a lot, too. Yeah. Right. And I hear it all the time. Right. It's like 
you know, it, there can't be that much difference between your feed and what I can buy down the street for $10 a bag less. Well, yeah, there actually can. Um, and there's different levels of feed that you have to be considerate of, right? So there's some birds in your flock that may never go for a show. They may never go to the fairgrounds. They may never go to a poultry show. You're keeping them back for brood stock because they're good. You like them, you know, they make a difference. Um, and then, you know, you've got that 20% that are going to go with you to, to show 20, 25%. Um, do they necessarily need to have the exact same feed? No, they probably don't. But then when I talk to a breeder and say, well, you can feed this group this and this group that, and they're like, I ain't going through all that. That's too much fuss and trouble and I'm not going to do it. And, you know, and, and I'm going to feed them all one feed. And of course they feed the cheaper feed because, you know, and everybody keeps way too many birds, right? They, they, they like this hen and they like that hen. They yeah. like this cock and, you know, um, they have a hard time calling and they have a hard time, you know, selling off birds. They get attached to them, whether it's emotional or financial or whatever. And they just can't, you know, they can't trim down the, the herd, so to speak. Um, but, you know, <coughs> for pretty much all, I work with all livestock and kind of a basic rule of thumb is to call out 10 to 20% annually at your most expensive time of year to feed them, right? You need to go through, look hard, make the, make the hard judgment calls. And eat, whether you sell them or, or whatever you do, but calling, the, calling them back down to a set number is very beneficial. And how you get people to do that is beyond me. I, I, hopefully you've got some words of wisdom on how to do that, because I, I you know, I really don't because I, there seems to be two camps and, and one group wants to call their birds too soon. And the other camp doesn't really want to call anything. It seems like I, you know, I'll, I'll yep. get folks co contacting me and well, I've got this four week old chick, which one should I keep? How do I know that they're not mature? Yep. You can't uh, tell at four weeks. Um, from sitting around listening to circles, you know, you can actually do a, you can probably do an initial call looking for defects at, at around eight weeks. It's pretty hard to do it much before eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Then you have a second selection somewhere between 12 and 16 weeks. Then pretty much after that, you're going to ride it out for close to a year to see how the bird fully develops. Right. Yes. But, and, and some of those slow to mature breeds like Jersey Giants, you may be looking at two years before what you see is what you've actually got. Right. But if you can knock that down by 50%, you know, by the six month period, you, mm -hmm. you should be able to see a lot of the defects, you know, by six months of age, not all, you know, there's stuff that's going to develop late, just like you said, and I understand that. Um, but you know, most people are carrying way too many birds. Um, I, I, and I agree I with see. you. I wish I could get people to understand what I call the rule of tens. For every 10 chicks you hatch, you're going to get one that's really decent enough to keep and move your program forward. Or yep. for every 100, you're going to get 10. Yep. But, and, and some folks just can't. Well, a friend of mine says if we, if we all ate our culls, we'd be in a lot better shape. <laughs> Well, there's other people out there with backyard chickens that would love to have your calls, right? Yes. You, you can still sell them to people in the neighborhood that aren't going to show and compete against you, right? Just put an ad on Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace. It, it's not that hard. You know, they're out there. And if you get your hatching around to the right time of year, <clears throat> you know, first of April, everybody's looking for chicks for their backyard. So. Mm -hmm. If you can get your timing right to get your hatches off and do that initial call, you know, by the 1st of April, you will have no problem selling them whatsoever. Just, I, you know, I, I just see people trying to keep way too many chickens and then they complain about their feed bill. And I'm like, well, why do you have so many chickens? You know, and I'm working with a, a lovely lady down in Texas right now. She had over 300 chickens in her yard. She wasn't focused on any one particular breed. She was just kind of all over the place because she loved chickens. And I'm like, all right, so you need to make this decision. Are you going to be a breeder 
or are you going to just have chickens? Because you can't do both. Okay. Right. You, you need to make the hard conscious decision. Um, and I said, I'm, I'm fine with either one. You, 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 you need to decide what works for you, but you can't keep a bunch of yard birds around for entertainment and try and be a serious breeder at the same time. There's too many risk involved. There's too many costs involved. And you, you just got to get, you just got to narrow it down and focus on something. So, uh, and she is, and yeah, it, it was a, it was a rough night when she called a third of her birds and, you know, sent them all off to be oh, sold. Yeah. But, um, yeah, she sees the light at the end of the tunnel and it, it'll get better. But Jeff, if you would talk a little bit about, uh, the various stages our birds go through from chicks to growers to, yep. to adults. Um, and, and what should our folks be looking for nutritionally speaking for, and we'll just start with day old chicks. Yeah. Day old chicks. I started on that road, um, 22, 23% protein. Make sure that those amino acids are where I talked about earlier, 1.1 1 .1 point on lysine, 0.5 on methionine. Try and look for the higher vitamin levels, right? The, the most you're gonna find on the shelf is about 4,000 international units per pound. It's okay. Uh, that's a good starting point. You know, we can look at adding supplements to that if we need to. That Those numbers stay the same all the way through the rearing stage. So 4,000 at starter, 4,000 at grower, 4,000 at developer. And whether you're going to layer or whether you're going to a holding feed, you know, it depends on your time of year. You don't want to feed a layer feed with high calcium year round. If your bird isn't producing an egg, feeding that extra calcium is not benefiting anybody. It's actually working against you. So, <clears throat> Working with breeders like you, Rip, what I do is, okay, so I ask you what breed do you have and what is what is that maturing date? So if you say, okay, it's 28 weeks till, till my bird gets to basically sexual maturity or that point, you know, they're not fully developed, but they're, they're pretty much at what we would call mature. Um, I divide that 28 weeks by four to tell me how long they need to be on starter, right? So for a 28 week bird maturing, seven weeks on starter, seven weeks on grower, seven weeks on a developer. <clears throat> and then, you know, then they're moving on, you know, to, to whatever's next. So I break that up into, uh, you know, three, I'm sorry, three equal segments. So you're gonna be nine weeks on each. That way I know that I'm hitting that nutritional need for that bird, you know, at each one of those stages of developing. Um, so you're starting out with 22, 23 protein, then you're gonna drop to, uh, on a show fowl, I would wanna be no less than 18 to 20 on a grower feed. Developer feed is gonna be 16 to 18% protein without the high calcium, okay, and that's, Again, focus on better amino acid levels. That's where your feather is coming from. That's where your body development's coming from. Um, hopefully, you know, if your feeds are being made somewhat local to you, they're being balanced for the right carbohydrates based on your temperature and your climate. Um, that would be really nice, but your starter feed should be, well, it's not on the tag. So how do I tell somebody you need 1300 kilocalories per pound, right? I, I don't know how to explain the energy part of it. Because if mm -hmm. a, a lot of feeds have a bunch of added fats added to them, they have higher energies. And all that's gonna do is start the formation of fat deposits, okay? At a very young age. And I don't really want a fat, I don't want fat starting to even begin to be deposited until the bird is about two thirds through that development phase. Um, you don't want any early age fat. So, uh, you know, you want a good exercise area so they can run some of that off. And um, you in Florida, I would want a lower energy. Um, you know, I would yeah. trim that energy because you, a chicken, people don't understand, a chicken actually eats for its energy needs every day. So based on the temperature, the living environment and everything else, it's going to eat the number of calories it needs 
to sustain itself on a given day. So on hotter days, they eat less. On colder days, they eat more. And that's just the nature of a chicken. Um, a lot of creatures are actually that way. All right, so we got the starter, we got the grower, we got the developer, and then you got to decide if you're, but so for a show fowl, pretty much going to be 17 plus 18 percent is pretty much going to be the maintenance level protein again i want at least a one percent lysine 1.2 is better i want at least a 0 0.5 0 0.47 0 0.5 on methionine to keep the plumage where it needs to be now each one of these diets i've found that if i keep my fiber level at five around five percent give or take one and my fat level at 5%, you know, four to 5%. That seems to be the best health number for keeping the birds good and healthy, looking good, not getting fat. <clears throat> um, so fat and fiber should pretty much always be equal. So if, you're, if your fiber goes up, you know, your fat can go up as well, but 5% fat, 5% fiber, um, really good numbers, really good baseline numbers. Um, up here in the north, we, you know, in the wintertime, I could go to six or six and a half percent fat to help compensate for cold mm -hmm. weather. Mm -hmm. But even in the south, you know, where you are, I wouldn't want to go below five. So people don't understand cholesterol, liver function in a chicken has a lot of similarities to you and I. So we need a certain amount of fat in our diet. Right, just for our liver to function correctly, cholesterol to be deposited, you know, it goes into the liver, gets broke apart, goes out and does a whole lot of functions in the body. And 5% seems to be the right number on for poultry, that is. Um, I have some poultry diets as high as 10%. Now that's getting really high. I don't recommend that to anybody, but on specialty cases or certain purposes, you can go as high. Uh, but if you keep it between four and six, five being the target number, I, uh, it's really good. And we're actually starting to learn more here in the U.S. about dietary fiber um, being important to a chicken. We've overlooked it for years. I mean, if, if I go walk down the aisle at the feed store, you're going to see a bunch of three, three and a half, three, you know, fibers. And a lot of that fiber is actually coming from very soft fibers like wheat middlings that, that don't have any structural density to them. Whereas feeding uh, something like an alfalfa meal, alfalfa hay, oats, barley, um, those all have a, a higher density fiber and it stays intact going through the gut wall and the intestinal tract and actually is scouring and cleaning that on a continuous basis. So I get more nutrient absorption through that intestinal wall than I do on a low fiber diet. Mm -hmm. What about things, um, and I know people are prone to feed things like scratch feeds or sunflower seeds. Um, <laughs> I, I've heard this before, but I, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, scratch grain really has no has no nutritional value to it other than carbohydrates. So scratch grains is gonna to lead to a fatter chicken. The scratch grain is like me having ice cream after dinner every night. A little bit, not a problem, okay? If I sit there and I eat the whole thing or that's all I eat, that's gonna become a big problem. You know, and the scratch grains and the sunflower seeds are pretty much in the same, same vein as me eating ice cream. You know, um, it's a feel good thing for the owner, right? My chickens love me when I show up with scratch grains. Well, you show up at my house with five gallons of ice cream, I'm gonna love you too. And it's, a, <laughs> it, you know, I mean, um, but it doesn't mean it's a good thing, right? Figure out a different treat for your chickens besides, you know, feeding them ice cream and, and stuff that doesn't really add to their nutritional health. Sunflower seeds, you. huh? I was just going to say one thing that I found a long time ago was I can take uh, some of my regular feed that I'm feeding them and moisten it. You know, I don't want it soupy wet or anything like that, but just enough to where it can stick together and roll it into little balls yep. and just toss some of those balls and moisten the feed out there and they go nuts for it. Yeah, just as like it was scratch grain. I mean, they, yeah. they like moistened feed. So, 
You want to make a treat? There you go. That's a perfect idea. Just like a real dry cookie dough kind of consistency, yeah, just yeah. enough to make a ball out of it. Mm -hmm, just get and, it all together. Yeah, you're delivering them the same thing. You're just delivering it in a different you form. And they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they think it's special. And I mean, if you want to trick them a little bit, you can put a teaspoon of molasses per quart of water before you do the moistening. Mm -hmm. And it'll change the aroma of it a little bit. And they'll get even a little bit more crazy about it. But you know what? A teaspoon in a quart of water is going to do almost 15 pounds of feed or more. Right. So you're, you're not throwing off that nutrition hardly at all. Right. Yeah. I got some other guys that are doing that and then freeze it and put it out there on the really hot, miserable days. Yeah. And just let them peck at some frozen food. And again, they love it. So. Good deal. Uh, sunflower about, seeds. Huh? Go ahead. So what about uh, over the counter feed supplements? What are your thoughts on those? I know there's a lot of them out there. I know. And I've never really found but one that I thought was worth investing in. A lot of that stuff is salt based. If you read really close, like, you know, the water, the water soluble vitamin mm -hmm. electrolytes mm -hmm. and a lot of that stuff, it has a lot of salt in it. And that's where the electrolyte parts come in and kind of kicking in are potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, sodium chloride. You know, you gotta be careful. Chickens have a really low, low threshold for salt and it, it just not. Again, and we're gonna start doing, if we do them all the time, every day, we're gonna start, you know, causing some kidney damage or we're gonna put extra stress on the kidneys. Let's put it that way. Did we do damage or not? Hard to tell. Um, you know what? If people wanna make their own chicken Gatorade, the recipe is really easy, okay? it. It's two ounces of apple cider vinegar, one tablespoon of molasses, put a teaspoon of salt in that. This is per gallon. Mix it up really well. If you think it needs color, put a little bit of food coloring in it. But otherwise, that mixture of vinegar, molasses, and a little bit of salt is gonna do way more than a bag of electrolyte that you're buying at the store, okay? And when you compare the cost of what I just described, you know, what do you got? 25 cents worth of ingredients to, mm. to make a gallon of, of, you know, chicken Gatorade. And the chickens are gonna thrive on it, especially when it's really hot. You know, when, like right now, this is a perfect time of year to be making a little chicken Gatorade, serve it, <clears throat> you know, two, three times a week, something like that. And they're gonna be, but I, you know, I purposely stay out of the, farm stores because and i don't walk down that chicken aisle to look at those supplements that you're referring to rip i just right. don't do it because right. i either get all riled up about the garbage they're serving people or i say something and then i, I you know i i set, you know i piss off one of my friends or something like that because they like it and i, and I explain to them why it, it yeah, they're getting ripped off but you know so uh, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything. And if I stay out of those aisles, I don't have to worry about saying something bad. <laughs> <clears throat> what about um, feed supplements? And and I'm going to preface before you respond. I'm going to preface this by saying that uh, Jeff has a feed supplement on the market that is the only one I've ever felt like was a worth the money, or b I wanted my birds to eat. But what are your thoughts on that? So what I did is I took, I, I averaged out like a bunch of ready to let, you know, layer feeds or commercially available feeds, knowing what the difference is between that and what a breeder or a show bird needed. So I put it in and I started adding the vitamin A, the vitamin D, the vitamin E, the lysine, the methionine, you know, and a different kind of protein. And that's how that supplement came about you know the breeder supplement that's that's how it originated and um you know at one teaspoon per bird per now one teaspoon per adult bird per day it works out to about three cents per chicken per day okay um it's 2.6 grams i took it home and weighed it on a gram scale so it, it ends up being about 2.6 2.7 grams per bird per day 
you know, it's a pain to deal with, but it, it, it's making up the difference between everyday chicken nutrition and breeder and show fowl nutrition that it's closing that gap. So it's you can show. continue to feed, you know, what you can find locally. And this allows us to supplement it, you know, um, and try and keep the cost down. That's, that's how that all got started. That, that's really what I sat down one day and said, man, these folks need help. And that's what I put together. You know, of course, Kenny and Frank, they tried it out and a few other people and um, everybody liked it. So we just rolled it out and started talking to people about it. But, and that's available in both a powdered form and a pellet form? Yep, yep. yep. we offer it in both powder and pellet. It comes in 10 pound and 40 pound bags um when they call in or they contact us you know we we have a shipping price regardless of where you're at and in all 50 states we can ship it uh u.s postal service will take it so the powder is uh 49 for a 10 pound bag it's 149 for the 40 pound the pellet is 55 for the 10 pound and 165 i think for the 40 pound bag i don't keep those numbers right on top of my head but also uh for our listeners out there um jeff has authored a book i very seldom hear him talk about it and promote it but um it it is a real eye-opener and um, if you have any desire to learn more about poultry nutrition, you need to get a copy of his book. Now, it was written for the pasture poultry. He just happens to have one handy there on the on the table. Great um, for pasture poultry people, but there is tons and tons and tons of just really great common sense information on there that will help you help your birds do the best that they can. So, Jeff, how can I get a copy of that? Um, easiest place to go is go to the Fertrell website, uh, F-E-R-T-R-E-L-L.com and uh, buy online and they can find that and the supplement right there on our Shopify website and they can place the order. Um, I believe it's $19.95 and that includes shipping for the book <clears throat> and really the books, a lot of just common sense. Um, yes, a lot of things that we forget about, you know, air quality, water quality, feed quality. Um, it goes through those nutritional requirements we talked about earlier, you know, for the different stages of birds, for the different types of birds. It's not just for the common domestic, you know, meat, chicken or layer. It's got section in there on breeders and heritage birds and how they need to be fed. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, you know, it's not an entertainment book whatsoever. You know, and it's well, it was me. I was. I you was were entertained. entertained. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 173 pages. And if you want to learn how to do it, in the back it tells you how to, uh, you know, formulate your own feed. I mean, there's enough information in there that you could sit down and and work out your own feed formula if you wanted to do that. Well, super. Jeff, I really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today. And, and we have literally just scratched the surface on poultry and poultry nutrition. Uh, and, and Jeff has very graciously agreed to come back on with us in the future and we'll talk some more. But Jeff, thank you so much. I know you're a busy guy, so I'll let you get back to all the good things you need to be doing today. Thanks, Rip. Thanks for inviting me. I have enjoyed the time. <laughs>